Thank you, everyone. Greetings in the precious name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, though we are few today, hopefully in the days to come, uh, more can join. I know there has been a break in our study with our travels, uh, but God willing, we can uh, in the days to come, more can join and we can have a session together. And uh, let me just open the presentation so we can see it together. All right. We have been meditating on Revelation chapter 6, and we have looked at the first two seals. If just very quickly looking back at what we had covered is uh, we saw the division of Revelation into three sections. We have looked at the first section, which is chapter 1 of uh, what John sees, then in chapters 2 and 3 of what is, which is the current age, the church age. And in chapters 4 and 5, we were taken with John to heaven and we saw the vision of the throne of God and of God himself uh, seated at the throne of the vision of what all uh, is surrounding him and the throne. And we also saw in chapter 5 of a scroll that was written within and without, sealed with seven seals and held in the right hand of God and we saw that no one was found to be worthy to take the scroll. Uh, but then, as John keeps looking at the throne, we see uh, suddenly in the midst of the throne, he sees a lamb that was slain standing there. And that lamb is seen to be worthy to take the throne, uh, the scroll from the one who sits on the throne and to open it and to read it. There's great joy, there is great rejoicing in heaven. We also looked at the seven types of worship that were happening in heaven, and we noticed that there was a crescendo of worship that starts right at the center of the throne and then proceeds outward and onward. We came to chapter 6, and we saw the Lamb. Now the focus has shifted from the throne to the lamb, and we read in chapter 6 and verse 1, I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Now remember I had mentioned to you that the seal was not a cross at one end, but rather it was uh, linear. It was one after the other. So a seal had to be broken so that that part of the scroll could be read, that judgment could be passed. We also remembered that these are judgments. It's a series of seven judgments. So the seven seals are seven judgments that are being executed by God on the earth in taking back what is rightfully his. Till now and even now, <clears throat> since the fall of man, Satan has been uh, the one who has claimed authority over the earth because, because of man's sin and his claim and the title, one of the titles he has is that he is the prince of the air, he is the prince of this world. But now God intervenes and passes judgment on the sinful earth and on sinful man in order to reclaim what is rightfully his. And so what we are seeing here are the series of judgments that are being passed on the earth and on humanity to reclaim what is rightfully his. And as each seal is broken, we have seen a specific judgment that is passed. The first seal that is opened, uh, which we have already covered, where we did not see, uh, it specifically did not look like a judgment because we have seen uh, a setting forth of peace, of a rider that comes forth riding on a white horse and he comes in as a peacemaker. Subsequently, we do understand as we continue in these uh, seals that he is a judgment, but it looks like it's not a judgment because he comes, he sets peace, he comes in conquering as a conqueror, but as a peaceful conqueror, because people give him all of the authority in a peaceful way. We looked at uh, the book of Daniel and also at many other references in Thessalonians, and maybe many other references, and we will go back to study this, uh, this person. He is a human being 
who is known as the Antichrist. He is the one who will be at the center of power, of government and authorities uh, towards the end in what is known as the tribulation period. As uh, chapter 6 starts, it is also the start of the specific seven-year tribulation. We also looked at chapter 4, and I want to say this again, is very clearly chapter 4, verse 1, denotes to us that the church will not pass through tribulation. The church will be, John representing the church, is taken away from the earth, and so will not pass through tribulation. There are many other teachings where which are churches that teach about uh, the church will go through tribulation, the church will be taken up in the midst of the tribulation, church will be taken up after the tribulation. But God's word is very clear. It is specific that the church will not pass through tribulation. The church will be taken away. And we have many references for that. But again, I do not want to go into it, but I just wanted to remind all of you. So when the uh, when this unlawful, a man comes in, a man who is demon-possessed, is possessed by the devil himself, comes in and is given the crown. Notice in verse 2, it says, he was given a crown. He did not take the crown, but he is given a crown. means people will offer him the authority uh, because they see him as a peacemaker. And he is uh, he makes a contract, uh, an agreement with uh, God's people, uh, the children of Israel. Again, the church is not there. The, the children of Israel, whom God has put his focus and his attention back. And so to this group, he makes a covenant. He makes a peace treaty. Today, if there is no peace in this world, one of the primary reasons is because of the nation of Israel and because of its capital city, Jerusalem, which is also claimed by the Arabs as uh, and, and by the Muslims as a holy city. But he somehow creates a peace treaty. And so Israel is at peace. They rebuild the, the temple at Jerusalem and they rejoice. But when the second seal, when the lamb opened the second seal, as we read in verse 3, the true color, the true nature of this person is revealed. And as uh, we see there, that he is riding a fiery red horse. His nature changes from one of peace towards one of war, and war especially towards the children of Israel. He breaks his covenant, and we again went into the, uh, went into the details of that in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. In the midst of the one week, remember the week, the 70th week of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, that he breaks his covenant, and he continues to, he, he also, and Daniel teaches us that he puts uh, an idol, what is known as the uh, abomination of desolation, in the temple and thus desecrates the temple or makes it unholy. And so he Israel realizes, oh, this person whom we thought was our Messiah, whom we thought was our uh, the peacemaker, is really against us. We now see his true colors. But by then, it's too late for them. And he focuses his attention in the second three and a half years towards the people of God, towards the children of Israel. And that is known as the Great Tribulation. So this is what we had considered last week. Uh, there were many, uh, or the last time we met, sorry, it was not last week. I'm sorry, we, due to our travels, could not uh, be there for the last few classes. Now we will go to chapter three. Uh, sorry, the third seal. When we come to verse 5, in uh, chapter 6, uh, Godsey, could you read verse 5? And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third bee say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Yeah, you can read the next verse also. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four bees say, a measure of wheat for a penny, a three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou heard not the oil and the wine. All right. I think it's very clear from here. We don't need too much of, uh, you know, even though there, there is symbolism, I think it's very clear to us what this black horse and, and the rider on the black horse denotes. 
It is a time of famine. It says a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. In other words, that the uh, wheat and barley are the basic, like how rice would be for us, for the uh, people of Israel in that area. Wheat is very basic and so is barley. And so that has become very expensive. In other words, as this war wages, and as he, you know, the, the previous one was he goes out to make war. And as he <coughs> wages war, typically in any war situation, what uh, there becomes a shortage of food because resources are diverted from what would normally be used to farm or to get food into suddenly into war. Uh, people would be drafted into the army. Uh, instead of farming, they would be focused on making uh, armaments and uh, you know ammunition. The the nation's wealth would be put into getting uh, more weapons created. So, with the focus being turned towards war, uh, there is famine, and so we see here one who sat on a black horse. So we have seen the white horse, which is peace. We have seen the red horse, which is war. And now this, the black horse, which is famine. And he who is sat on it has a pair of scales. Everything is being weighed and measured and, and people are suffering. But notice one thing there, that even as there is a great famine that is going around, there is a command to not hurt the oil and the wine. What does that mean? Oil and wine, when we look into God's word, and historically when we look at it, were used for treatment, where it was, had a medicinal value. And that is what is being referred here. Because war, again, has created uh, many who are hurt, many who, who need medical aid. And so it is that even as the famine is raging, there is a need for medicines. Do you remember even James says that if anyone is sick, let him call the elders and let him come home and pour oil and pray for him. You know, uh, there, there that oil is for medicines. When the when the Samaritan, when the good Samaritan was um, uh, healing that person who or or was taking care of that person who uh, had been beaten by the robbers on the wayside, we see that he bound his wounds with oil and wine. It again is the same reference here. It is of medicinal value. So while there is famine, while there is a need for uh, food and food is expensive, it says here that the a quarter of wheat for a day's wages. So if a person has to buy even a little amount of wheat uh, or three quarters of barley for day's wages, his entire wages, he just gets a little bit measure of of food. And so it is a time where there is great famine, people are suffering, but the leader is focused <coughs> on war. I'm sorry, I have a bad throat also after my travel. Do excuse me. Uh, as we look into this, we see in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7, the Lord, uh, you remember, we were parallelly looking at Matthew chapter 24, and so in chapter 24 and verse 7, we read, uh, God, see, could you read that, please? Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. For nation shall rise against a nation, and kingdom against that is That is the war part that we had seen. Yes, keep going. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Yeah. Right, just that part. So we, the, the, the nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom is the red horse. And the result of that is there will be famine and pestilence. It is a time the Lord himself specifically said that there will be uh, uh, famine and pestilence. So even as the oil and the wine or the medicinal value is retained, uh, people are suffering because of severe famine. And as that suffering continues, we see the fourth seal being opened. Could you read verse 7 and 8? And when he had opened the fourth seal, 
I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. Again, uh, there's no need for much explanation here. It's quite clear to all of us because uh, the, the symbol is clearly explained. When the fourth seal is broken, a rider on a pale horse. Now, we might have not understood that very clearly, but it, it follows immediately by saying, and the name of him who sat on it was death. Death is very familiar to all of us. right? Well, since the time man is born, a person is born, death always looms ahead of him. And the fear of death is what drives man towards doing whatever is necessary to avoid death. So death is very familiar to all of us. Uh, from the Garden of Eden, from the fall of man, death is, is, is certain for, you know, if anything else is certain for a human being who is born on the earth, it is that he will die. One day he will die. And uh, whether rich or poor or uh, strong or weak, for every person, man or woman, boy or girl, death is a certainty. And so we are very familiar with this rider. But notice one thing, along with death follows Hades or hell. And now hell is something that many are not familiar with and uh, try, uh, you know, even try to ignore it and say, oh, there is no hell. You know, once we die, that is it. And then we do whatever uh, you know, live today, live for today and tomorrow we don't know what will happen. These are the philosophies of mankind to ignore the reality of death. But the Bible tells us very clearly, after death, there are only two ways. And that choice is made while we are still alive. There are many philosophies and even Christian theology which teaches that even if a person dies, we can pray and send him up into uh, heaven and avoid hell. But the word of God is very clear. You make your choice while you are on this earth. And the choice is simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And if you do not believe, then you will face the wrath of God. And God is a God who is a terrible God of judgment. You know, we are also reminded, kiss the son lest he be angry. God the Father sent his only begotten son into this world so that we could be saved. If we reject that gift of salvation, can you imagine the anger that that, that person would face, the wrath that he would face as a sinner, as one who has rebelled against God and gone against God's uh, commandments already? the person is facing God's wrath. But added on to that now is the aspect of rejecting the gift of God, rejecting the sacrifice of his beloved son. How much more is that anger now that this, the, that person is to face? And so we see this writer with a very familiar name and with a name that to us as Christians is familiar, but to many who try to ignore that death and Hades followed him and power was given to him. Notice again that when we are born, when we will die, what will happen to us? Everything, it is God who has decreed it. And it is only when God gives the power or the authority can even death do anything against us. How wonderful it is to be reminded that when we die, it is not a mistake. We might die in an accident. We might die all of a sudden. We, our death might be uh, a slow death. It might be a painful death. It might be a death of, uh, you know, due to hunger or due to sickness, whatever it is. But let us be reminded that our time of death is decreed by God. And unless God gives death the power to take the life of that individual, he cannot do anything. Death is powerless unless God so says it. And let us praise God that as children of God, 
there will one day be that wonderful song that will sing that we will sing as even as we are lifted up saying oh death where is your victory oh grave where is your sting how wonderful it is that we are victorious over death because of christ because of what he has done for us and because we are his children how wonderful so we don't have to fear this death that hades uh, of course we are not there when this happens but i'm saying even today while we are on this earth we have no fear over death nothing can touch us remember the life of job that when satan wanted to inflict job you know that's such a wonderful encouraging um, example that has been given to us that satan could not even touch a hair from job's head unless god had given him the power unless god had said yes you can do this but i am giving you a boundary you cannot go beyond this boundary and he had to go back to him again to say lord i need that boundary expanded and the lord gave him a little bigger boundary right so here death and hades followed him <coughs> and power was given to him to kill a fourth of the world a fourth of humanity the a fourth of the earth is being killed so let us assume today that there are 8 billion people on this earth it's a little bit around that number just but for easy calculation so if 8 billion people that means 2 billion 1/4 is 2 billion 2 billion will die in that short period of time they will die from what sources they will die from the sword which is war they will die from hunger so the uh, and they will die from the beasts of the earth and their death will be terrible now when when we if we had read the you know and from the beasts of the earth uh, a few years ago before covid we would have said oh what is this beasts of the earth you know man has subdued all the beasts but do you do you remember during covid what happened when humanity was inside afraid of this little virus the animals were outside and it is said that the animals came out of the jungle and they were roaming on the streets and they were roaming out in the time of the judgments these animals these wild animals these beasts of the earth would be freely roaming and would attack anyone and everyone again the war has destroyed probably their natural habitat their forests or whatever war means there would have been fires and there would have been many other you know bombs would have been dropping and so the animals are now forced to come out and they too are killing so there is death by hunger death by sword and death by the beasts of the earth how many in today's population statistics almost 2 billion people 2 billion that's a huge number double the population of india would have died because of this and only because the power was given to uh, to death to take that in uh, matthew chapter 24 and verse 8 you read that please we the lord talked about it and he said that these signs are all these are the beginnings of sorrows all these are just the beginning of sorrows if these four riders have brought war and hunger and death and death to the point of 2 billion that has never been that kind of a catastrophe even the covid did not reach that those numbers but in those times and yet the lord says this is just the beginning of sorrow tribulation is just starting judgment is just starting the lord is saying that i have, have only begun my judgment now the 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 billions that will die on this earth that is also remember that they would be unbelievers they would be unrepentant human beings on the earth those who have rejected god those who have rejected god's command and his gospel that would have died so are they believers on this earth we will come to that in a very little time and we see that because when you turn to the next verse god see could you read from 9 to 11 and when he had opened the fifth seal i saw unto the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of god and for the testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice saying how long o lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth 
Yeah, in verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. A fifth seal is a judgment, but here is some details we get to see about this, and it, it, uh, it needs a little bit of clarification, unlike the other four seals. It says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Why were they killed? They were killed for two reasons. And these two reasons repeat over and over again. We have seen that before also. For the word of God and for the testimony. Two reasons that they have been killed. So who are these? They are not unrepentant. They are not unbelievers. They are believers. They are believers who are holding on to the word of God. And they are believers who are willing to sacrifice their lives, to be martyrs for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, fires are raging in, in Manipur and in many parts of India. Churches are being demolished. God's people are standing for the word of God and for the testimony of Christ. They are willing. They are willing to be martyred. The world is ignoring it. The world is treating the a person who is on authority today as a superstar, as a rock star. Australia has welcomed him with open arms while he has allowed for the country to, to turn against God's people. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming very soon. And so here we see a similar group of people when the fifth seal was broken. So when the fifth seal was broken means this is during tribulation. A reminder again that this is not the church. We saw even before the tribulation started that the church has been raptured. Which means that there is another group of people, another group of God's people who are there and we will talk about it. They are those who are being killed, who are being martyred. They are holding on to the word of God. They are being, they are keeping the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and they are being martyred and they are crying out from under the altar, how long, O oh Lord, how holy and true until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. These are being continuously martyred. They are being targeted. They are being forced to recant their faith, to say against the word of God, but they are standing strong and they are being killed. Now, who are these? As we go into the next chapter, we will see a little bit more about them, but they are known as as the tribulation saints. They are those who when the rapture took place, they had not accepted Christ. And that is why they are not part of the church. They are not part of the bride of Christ. But after the rapture take pl takes place, there will be many who were attending church, who have heard the pastors, who have heard the preachers, who have heard the messages, who have heard the call of salvation and yet rejected the Lord, who suddenly realize Oh, what my uh, elder told me or what my parents told me or what my ch church pastor was telling me was true. It is a fact. Jesus Christ has come and taken away the bride. They will go back. They will read the word of God and they will understand. But it will be too late to be part of the bride of Christ. But remember that we had refer referenced earlier also that God will Always <clears throat> keep a group who have not bowed their head, uh, their knees to bow. God will always keep a remnant for him. God will always keep someone who will be a testimony for him. God will never leave the earth without someone who can testify about him. And so he creates this new group now. If in Corinthians we are told that there is neither Jew nor Greek, but we are now a new group called the Church of God. Now there is another group after the church has been removed, which is known as the Tribulation Saints. 
they are believers but they have believed after the rapture the problem with believing after the rapture is that they have to now be willing to give their life look at the church today how many of us give our lives for the word of god and for the testimony of god we don't we are not being targeted like in those days in those seven years there will be total focus targeted towards <clears throat> this group of people and we will see later that they will not be able to buy bread they will not be able to live in the society they will be they will be hiding they would be uh, targeted if anyone saw them they would point them out and they would be taken and they would be forced to either say i reject christ or they would be killed and they would die by the thousands probably by the millions i don't know but it would be a large number and that is why when the fifth seal is open under the altar remember we saw the old <clears throat> altar in chapter 4 and the altar that is at the, at the throne of god which we have seen in 4 and 5 from the altar from under the altar their blood cries out for vengeance and what is it that they are crying they are crying out saying lord how long how long before you come and you 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 destroy our enemy that you take action vengeance against what these people are doing the cry would be lord aren't you seeing it today if we cry and if we ask the lord saying lord aren't you seeing what is happening in those days that cry would be much more <clears throat> as i told you the 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 ferocity the ferocity with which the enemy would be focused and targeting god's people would be severe we cannot imagine it today if today we think there is persecution it is nothing compared to the way persecution would be at that time in the days of the soviet union uh, before russia it was known as the soviet union communist soviet soviet union uh again religion was outlawed and especially there was a target against christianity and the russian soldiers the ussr it was known as ussr united socialist republic of russia they would come into a village and and this is a, a, a true story they came into this village where there were many who were believers who were christians and they forced the people to come out at gunpoint they put a bible in the middle of the of the uh, in front of them and told each one of them step forward put your leg on the bible and curse god and say and reject christ many even though they were believers many fearing the uh, death came forward and rejected christ and put their feet on the bible and rejected christ a little girl comes forward picks up that by now torn and tattered bible holds it close to her, her chest and says oh my lord how can i reject you ah uh, and with tears said this is my god my lord who who shed his blood for me and for my salvation i cannot reject in the front of in front of all of maybe even a family were there they ruthlessly shot her down and she died there as a martyr for Christ just like how Stephen had died but this gave courage to the rest of the village and one by one they came and they said he, even some of them who had rejected Christ came forward and said he is my lord and there were many who were shot there but that incident will happen all over the world the antichrist will target each and every one of them and the cry will keep rising from the altar how long oh lord how long before you avenge the blood but notice what the response was what did we read there god see the response was it's right the they in verse 10 they called out with a loud voice how long lord sovereign lord holy and true until you judge the inhabitants of the earth 
you know and and they are then given notice one thing then each of them were given white robe and they were told to wait a little longer verse 11 they were told to wait a little longer to wait the answer was not oh i'm just coming and i will rescue you no the answer was wait wait for what Today we say that if the, the church of God or God's the Lord's coming is delayed because he is waiting for more souls to be added to the kingdom of God. But in those days, he says that wait until the number of your fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed are, is completed. The number of those who are going to be martyred needs to be completed. That is what the wait is for. He says he gives them white robes. White robes shows purity. It shows holiness. He gives them. They are given these white robes, but they're told, wait, wait a little longer. Let's go to what the Lord had to say in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21 and uh, 22. Could you read that? Matthew chapter 24, verse 21 and 22. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Oh, how wonderful it is that it says that with, such will be the great tribulation. We've been reading about it, uh, that it would be great tribulation here. It, and this tribulation is targeted at the people of God. And if you read the previous verses, it talks about uh, those who are on the house top to run away and those who are with child, it would be hard for them and all of it. It says that for God's people, it would be a great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning, as that's what we were talking about. But it says, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The, the time is there. It is seven years, but as people go through it, those seven years might feel like 700 years. It will be terrible times. The tribulation will be terrible, especially in the second part, the three and a half years. Everyone will be targeted. Even the Jewish nation will be targeted. In all seven years, believers will be targeted. But, uh, but the Jewish nation will face some sort of relief in the first three and a half years. But during the great tribulation, during three and a half years, there will be severe tribulation. Uh, there will be severe persecution. And except those days would be shortened, there would have no flesh that would have survived. It's a terrible time and people are faced with this great tribulation. And as we read here that God's people are asked to be patient. In Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 17, uh, could you read that? Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 17. You're muted, Augustine. You're muted. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. Then he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. And ah, was... Notice, no, yeah, that's all. Notice now what he, meaning Christ, what he's put on, he's put on his breastplate of righteousness, which even to us, we have been given as part of our armor of God. He's put on the helmet of salvation, which again, God has given to us also as the armor of God. But now he has put on the garment of vengeance. You know, God is a God who is a God of vengeance. In his time, he will take action against those who, uh, who, who are going against him. We see that with the king of Babylon. Babylon was used by God to punish God's people. But at, at the right time, that action was taken against uh, the Babylonians. And so the same way it is here, that there will be, uh, he puts on the garment of vengeance. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, uh, Apostle Paul says that, and the, uh, and the times of this ignorance, God winked it, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day. God knows. And God's appointed a day. There is a day in his calendar. He's marked out saying it's a day of vengeance, a day of judgment, a day in which he will judge the world and righteousness by the man whom he hath ordained. Where God 
through his ordained man, the man Christ Jesus, has ordained a day when there will be righteousness, there will be judgment on this world. And as believers, as the uh, as those of the uh, during the, the time of the tribulation, these saints, the tribulation saints, are asked to be patient because there are more to be martyred. Blood will run thick under the altar, but it will be a time that that vengeance will be revealed. And then we move on to the 12th, uh, sorry, the 6th seal in verse 12, uh, if you could read from verse 12 onwards. Um, but as we read, we will stop, uh, or, or let me read it. I watched as he opened the 6th seal. When the 6th seal is opened, we see great calamity that hits different elements of the universe. It starts off with the sun turned black. Now today, we, our lives are dependent on the sun, even if we don't realize it, that and we take the sun for granted, that our lives are dependent on the sun for its heat, for its light, for its, uh, even the radiation that it, it brings us. Uh, the life on earth exists today because of our sun but the sun will be darkened. Sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. Means pitch black. It's just turned dark completely. Of course, if the sun is dark, the moon does not get its light because the moon is uh, dependent on the sun's light. And it says here, the whole moon turned blood red. Now people have taken this whole blood moon and they've taken it out of proportion and there are so many prophecies of the blood moon. It's none of that. It is just that there is no light from the sun. It takes uh, radiant light from around and it has, uh, and John looked at it and it looked red. That's it. There's nothing of all of these so-called philosophies that have come out of the blood moon and, and based on that predictions of when the earth, when the coming of the Lord. No, 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 no. It's just let's read it as it is. The sun turned black, like sackcloth, means the sun's light is somehow hidden. We don't know how. Okay. And, and it's not a black hole. Let's again clarify that. Stars typically, and sun is one of the stars. Uh, and if, if for those of you who study physics, you know that when a star uh, goes nova is when it explodes. And after explosion, the last phase of a, of a star's life is when uh, after it has gone supernova, which means it has exploded, is then it implodes or all of its energy comes back to it and it forms what is known as a black hole. A black hole is what absorbs anything else around it. And so when you look into the sky, you can't see anything because of this black hole. But that is not what is here. It is not a black hole. It just says the sun was darkened. Something was blocking the light of the sun. How do we know it? Because afterwards we see that the sun is still there and it's still giving light as when we go to the subsequent cha chapters. But if it was a black hole, it would have just sucked in the earth and nothing would have remained. So it is not a black hole. Something is blocking the sun and so its light is not reaching us on the earth. Notice the artist also has rendered it that way. The light is not reaching the earth. It's become dark. And because of that, the moon has is just reflecting some ambient light and uh, you know, maybe from other stars or even from the earth or we don't know. And it's it looks like it's turned blood red. The stars in the sky fell on the earth. Again, these are, you know, when John looked, it looked like stars falling. Today, we know that these are called meteors. And again, if you study astronomy, between Jupiter and Saturn, there are a lot of asteroids there. What is known as the asteroid belt. And so probably from there it came or it's a ray or something, uh, you know, maybe a big comet came and exploded. We don't know. But clearly, as John looked into the sky, he saw a meteor shower. He saw things that are falling on the earth. He says that stars in the sky fell to the earth as late figs drop upon a fig tree. When we look at this and John looks up, and even as people of that time, when they're living there, when they look up, all of this is scary. Meanwhile, what's happening on the earth? You, know, you notice that when he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. Again, these are things that happen 
uh, uh, immediately and directly when the earth, uh, the, the sixth seal is open. So it's almost like when the Lord opened the sixth seal, that all of nature started getting into uh, into trouble. There was earthquakes, the sun is not giving its light, the moon is not there in the night, there is a meteor shower that's falling in, and uh, terrible things are happening. And so man is totally confused. <coughs> when we go into verse 14, it says, the, uh, the sky receded like a scroll. So when we look into heaven, since the time we have opened our eyes and we have looked up, we have always seen the sky. We have seen this blue sky and we have seen the universe beyond it. But here it says that this sky was ripped apart and it is open. Rolling up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. In other words, all of nature that we know today, the structure is changing and things have all become bad. But uh, as we look at this, and as we look into verse 15, we see one thing that the kings of the earth or the people in power are running around and saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? There is fear, fear in the heart of those in authority and definitely those around. Do you remember when Stephen was stoned that as people stood around and threw stones at him, he looked into heaven and he said, Behold, I see heaven open and the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of, the, the one, uh, of God. The heavens were open there, but as a child of God, when heaven is open, you see your Savior and joy comes in your heart and there is worship. Here, at this time, when heaven is open, so now let us look back. So was it the sky that was open? No. Was it the universe that was open? No. It is the very place of God. The heaven where God is was opened and man could see into the throne of God. And he says, I see the throne. When John saw the throne, he did not have fear. He had joy. He only was sad when the scroll could not be opened. But here is unrepentant man who sees into the throne because the heaven has been opened. And he is with fear because he can see the one who is on the throne. And he sees the lamb. And he sees the wrath that is coming. How terrible it is for those time, for those people. Uh, it, it says here that fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne. In Isaiah 34 verse 1, or when Isaiah chapter 34, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 34 and we read from verse 1. It talks about this time uh, and, and Isaiah looks in, uh, prophetically at this time and he says that the Lord who is upset, he tells you know, the a judgment is coming. And he says, come near, you nations, and listen. Pay attention, you people. In verse 2, it says, the Lord is angry with all nations. And in verse 4, it says, all the stars of the heaven will be dissolved, and the sky rolled up like a scroll. That is what they're seeing here. The sky has been rolled up. Heaven has been rolled up and they can see straight into heaven. Judgment is coming against the nation. Judgment is coming and they are afraid. The, people, the nations are afraid. Turn to Haggai chapter 2 and verse 6. And we read there, For thus says the Lord, of course, Yet once, it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. That shaking is happening here. And people of God are afraid. And notice there is a question that is asked, uh, saying, there is a question that is asked, just, just a minute. Uh, one of my slides is not showing. Okay, I don't know why that slide is not showing. And, and there is a question that is asked here, saying, who will stand Sorry. 
who the the great day of the lord has come and who can stand even they acknowledge that they are not able to stand in the presence of the lord while they are focusing on the martyrs while they are focusing on people while they are focusing to to uh, attack god's people there is a question that is asked saying who will stand in the the day of the wrath has come and who will stand it's a terrible time and a question and and it's a question that needs to be answered but man is not able to answer that question in first thessalonians chapter 5 the the, the, the apostle paul reminds us in verse 2 and 3 for your you yourself know perfectly that the day of the lord so cometh like a thief in the night it is coming like a thief in the night and they shall not escape it who can escape no one who will be able to stand no one no one who has rejected god would be able to stand and the answer is there given very clearly let us praise god that we have been saved so that we are not in that of those people who are asking who can who is able to stand and again first thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7 and 8 it says when the lord is revealed with his angels that he is coming to take vengeance on them that know not god and obey not the gospel of our lord, lord jesus christ how precious it is that we have been saved the gospel has reached out to us we have accepted the gospel we have become his children again in uh, in the thessalonians paul again reminds in second thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12 that they who are who have not believed on the truth and who have pleasure in unrighteousness they will be damned they will be destroyed let us praise god that we children of god that that we have feared god and that god has heard us and has put our names in the book of life and there is a book of remembrance that is written about us how wonderful it is the question is answered the the question that they are asking the answer is very simple but they are persecuting those who know the answer they were persecuted because of the word of god and the testimony that they held but let's praise god that god knows us and we would be able to stand because of the righteousness of him in verse 17 it says they shall be mine say the lord we belong to him when i make my in that day when i make my jewels i will spare them as a man spared his own son how wonderful that we have been saved we have been kept aside we belong to him god says they are mine how wonderful it is let us praise god Uh, i had hoped to do a little bit more uh, i don't know can i take a little bit more time uh, shiva sister or we do it next week maybe we'll do it next week we will close here because hopefully next week more people can also join uh, we will close here and the next week we will look at the next two chapters notice one thing we have done six seals we have not done the seventh seal because it, the, the way the book of revelation is that after six judgment there is always a break what is known as an intermission so next week we will look into that in the intermission time and then we will look back at chapter 8 and 9 where we will see the trumpet uh, judgment but for now we will close uh, with a word of prayer let's look to the lord father god we thank you for this time you've given us to be in your presence we thank you for so wonderfully revealing to us what the future holds for us it is so clear it is so crystal clear to to us of what god has planned for this world we thank you for your amazing love we thank you that love came and sought hold of us and, and brought us into your saving presence we thank you that for your for the gift of salvation we thank you for calling wretched people like us enemies rebels those who had no love for you those who were away from your presence you your love caught us held us and today you say that we are precious how wonderful it is lord we thank you for this time when the the period of grace is extended and we pray that many many of our dear ones our relatives our friends our contacts our our social network would come to know jesus christ as their, as their lord and savior we were thinking about that great tribulation time 
where judgment will be poured out on this earth. And we cannot imagine our dear ones going through it, Lord. We pray that your spirit would work in their hearts and convict them, Lord. And we thank you that in your gracious plan, you have kept us, the church, away from this time of judgment. We thank you. Bless all of us who gathered here this, this night. We thank you in the precious name of Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.